Hello friends, welcome back to my channel or if you're new here, welcome. Um, today I have for you a video. <laughs> um, I don't know what I'm going to call it yet exactly. It's not really a book review. It's more of like a book chat, book talk. I wanted to chat with you guys about The Burning God. Obviously it just came out uh, a couple of weeks ago now and hopefully a lot of you have had the time to read it because um, I did want to chat. Spoilery talks about the ending um, because for me I really think this was like the perfect ending to this series. This is the thing right like nobody needs to like the ending like even though I think it was perfect for what the book, what I feel like the series has been trying to do this whole time, um, even though I feel like it was very well executed, I understand that like not everyone feels that way. That being said, I do feel like some of the conversations around the ending um, lack kind of a little bit of context in terms of um, both the history, the culture, um, and also like I feel like they lack the context of perhaps like what I believe R.F. Kwong was trying to do with the story. Um, just for full disclosure, I did also watch Rebecca's live last week, maybe a couple weeks ago, um, where she did talk about the ending as well, where she essentially just like confirmed what she was trying to do. And I was like, yes, absolutely. You rocked it, ma'am. <laughs> but I did want to chat about it because um, I don't know, like I just... You all know I love this series so much. I always get really disappointed when I see people not like the ending, um, possibly because they just didn't understand it. And I'm not trying to be like condescending about this at all or whatever. It's just that like sometimes certain things go over our heads. So I just wanted to like highlight why I personally felt like this was like the perfect ending um, and kind of address some of the criticisms I've seen flying around. This is going to be a bit of a messy video. That's why I'm not calling it a review or anything. It's just going to be like a chat. I'm just going to be like sitting here and like doing a bit of rambling. Hopefully that's okay with you guys. If it wasn't clear already, this is going to be a very spoilery chat. <laughs> so if you have not read the ending um, and you do not want to be spoiled, don't watch this video. Like, exit now. Now exit. I'm gonna... big warnings. <laughs> um, yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna be talking major character deaths, major character, like, major plot things. I don't know. <laughs> um, but... Kind of one of the major criticisms. So let's recap. Let's recap the ending. So essentially what you have in The Burning God is the story of kind of the Chinese Revolution. And you have the, um, I don't know, I don't even remember what Rin calls her, her republic anymore. But you have the People's Republic of China, essentially, like the communists, Rin, and her people. And then you have the Republic um, of China, which is the Dragon Republic. Um, and they are the nationalists who, by the way, like in history, like, I feel like it's kind of depicted in, in the popular world, but like, it's not super, super explicit. But like in history, even though the Republic of China, aka like the Dragon Republic in this series, even though they are under the guise of like democracy, I think it's like, it's pretty implied though that they are also another kind of like, almost like a dictatorship. Um, I know in Taiwan, the People's Republic of China, um, they ruled under like a single party rule for like decades. Just a quick disclaimer before I continue on because I feel like I'm like talking about history as if I actually know what's going on. I'm I'm not a historian like all I know about history is like from you know when I used to go traveling and learned a little bit of history there um, and like from TV and, and movies and books but like I don't know I'm not a historian like let's just put that out there if I have made any like historical inaccuracies please feel free to correct me in the comments down below I don't even know where I was going with that but the point is the point is it's not that like I think it's like a mistake to think that um both Rin's army and like the dragon republic that they are kind of two opposing sides because essentially they want the same thing right like at the end of the day both parties just want control like they don't really want a fundamentally different system in their country um so it's really interesting to see them kind of like fighting and like the dragon republic being like we're here for democracy and it's like no you're not honey shut up you're not <laughs> um but anyway so that is kind of like the main conflict of the book like that they're essentially fighting for power over Nakara. What ends up happening is, and this is like major spoilers, so if you if you really haven't read the book, please, please don't continue watching. But at the end of the book, what ends up happening is um, Katai, Rin, and uh, Nuja meet up on Spear, um, and they have like a whole chat. They have a chat. And at this point, Rin has essentially taken power in Nakara. Um, but she's 
kind of quickly realize that she can't, she can't, like, she can't help her country recover. Like, people are still in poverty because of the war. People are living in, like, absolute shit conditions, and they have no money, and she can do nothing about it. Like, there's nothing she can do. Um, and essentially, she goes to Nija for help because she's, like, super desperate, or Nija offers to help. Offers to help. Um, and essentially what he offers is that he offers... Hesperian influence, um, which is a very interesting conversation um, to have. And then essentially what happens at the end is that Rin and Katai die so that the Hesperians will respect Nuzha so that Nuzha can take over, which is an interesting, first of all, interesting commentary on kind of like a what if, like what if the um, People's Republic of China, what if the communists did not win the Chinese Civil War, um, which is like another, just like another little thing at the end to think about. But what I've seen a lot of people say is that how disappointed they were in the ending for a couple of reasons. A, they were disappointed that Rin lost, essentially, um, and then they were disappointed that they had to end up turning to the Hesperians for help. Let's address the whole Rin losing thing. First of all, Rin didn't lose the war. Like, I don't <laughs> Did we read this in the same book? Because Rin did not lose the war, per se. Rin won the war. But then post-war, she couldn't get her shit together, essentially, to actually form a country, and fa actually form a governing party. And that's the problem. And, and, and I think if you have been following the books, like, you would know that Rin is not a peacetime ruler. Rin is a, a soldier. Like, they talk about this all the time in the book. She is a soldier. And I think it's a really interesting commentary on, um, on revolutions in general. Um, I know Rebecca Kwong in her live, she mentioned how she wanted to highlight the fact that like revolutions, um, rebellions, they often do fail and she kind of wanted to depict that. And I think she did that, a really good job of that um, and to not idealize. Like I feel like in fantasy, okay, first of all, first of all, this is a grim dark fantasy, right? Like anyone who is expecting a semi-happy ending out of this, like <laughs> you were never gonna get that out of the series. But, um, <laughs> but in terms of Rin's like rebellion, I feel like I feel like throughout the books it's pretty clear that Rebecca has always um, portrayed um, history in a very realistic sense and she's always portrayed war in a very realistic sense like she's always depicted kind of the real brutalities of war and that's what I love most about the series so I think for the ending to show a failed revolution um, is very fitting for this book because like like Rebecca said like in real life that's what happens revolutions happen all the time and like nine times out of ten if not more, they fail. At any point in the re like revolution, rebellion process, like whether it's before the fighting even starts, during the fighting, or like after the fighting, which is what happens with Rin, is that she wins the battles, but like she isn't able to actually create anything out of it because she doesn't have, <laughs> she doesn't have brain cells. My girl Rin has no brain cells, okay? <laughs> um, but yeah, so on that note, I'd, I'd say, like, in all honesty, like, if you were upset by the fact that, like, Rin didn't win the war or whatever, I think that's, that's a little misguided. Because, um, first of all, like, that's not the point of this book. The point of this book is not to show, you know, Rin taking on the world. Um, it's really to show total devastation that war causes. Um, and I think that in that sense, that particular aspect of the ending was really, really well done. On the Hesperians, <laughs> I have things to say about this. Okay, so I have seen people say that it's really disappointing that, and this is this is the words that I have seen floating around, okay? I've seen people say that it's disappointing that in the end, what ends up happening is that the Hesperians end up colonizing Nikara. And first first things first, I think that is not that is not what happens at all. At all. And I think fundamentally we need to understand the difference between colonization and imperialism. Um, and they are both sides of like the same coin, but they are also very different things. So they are both born out of like oppression and hate um, and the need for power um, and for one group of people to oppress another. But they are two very different executions of that mo motivation, if you will. Um, so colonization is like essentially one group of people, one country physically taking control of another country. So think, think, you know, Japan in, <laughs> Japan in Nanking, for example, in, during the rape of Nanking, they physically took over the city. Um, think the Americas, um, 
when the white people came and they colonized the land because the land belonged to the indigenous people here. Um, and that's colonization. That is like the people physically taking the land away from the people who were native to those countries. Imperialism is more about political alliances, political power and structures, and monetary power as well. Um, so if you think about it, to this day, we have not shed imperialism from the world. Like, the whole world is like shrouded in imperialism. Like, if you think about things like foreign aid and whatever, whatnot, those are all part of imperialism. And so to this day, we live in an imperialistic society, no matter where we are in the world, right? And it's, it's incredibly naive to think that imperialism doesn't exist. Obviously, I can't speak outside of my own experience, but I can tell you for a fact, like, for example, Hong Kong, just for like a bit of context, like the way I related this book to my personal knowledge and experience is that like, so Hong Kong was colonized by Great Britain um, for a hundred years, give or take. And now it is no longer a colony of, uh, of uh, the United Kingdom. However, imperialistic mindsets, imperialistic structures still exist, right? Like you don't, you have physically left the country, but your power and your hold on these countries still exists. You think about, for example, just education in Hong Kong, um, and you think about how a lot of the top schools, top quote unquote, okay, top schools are international schools in Hong Kong, and they teach a lot of their curriculum in English, and also a lot of the more prestigious, kind of the more el elite, you know, top 1% students, they end up going abroad to study. And in Chinese culture, in Hong Kong, one of the most prestigious things you can do um, is to get a foreign degree. And like, I know, for example, like for me in Hong Kong, there's a lot of things that I can't do because I don't speak Chinese, but like at the same time, just because I speak English fluently, just because I have a degree from England specifically, I can, that opens up so many doors for me. Um, even though it, doesn't really make sense. And then in terms of politically, like you still see the after effects, right? Like you still see in Hong Kong, some of the laws are based off of British law. And it's just, I think it's completely naive to look at the ending of The Burning God and think to yourself, well, it's kind of sh like, I can't believe the Nakara would let the Hesperians, you know, rule, so to speak. I don't know too much about this, but I know Rebecca mentioned it in her live, but like she talks about how after World War II, a lot of countries that were um, struggling after the war, a lot of countries had to turn to Western influences and Western governments for help. Um, you think about things like the rape of Nanking. And part of the reason why China didn't ask, the Chinese government didn't ask for reparations after the rape of Nanking is because they needed to maintain a relationship with the US and because the US needed to maintain a relationship with Japan because of war shit. It directly had an influence on what the Chinese government could and couldn't do politically. And it's a very complicated subject. It's a very complicated Sim, almost like a symbiotic relationship between countries with like varying power dynamics that like I am not um, equipped nor do I have the knowledge to really discuss in full but I just I just wanted to highlight that I've also seen people say like it's really it was that chapter in New City or whatever when they go to New City and Rin's a little like do people actually like like Hesperian rule here um, and I've, I've seen people say they felt uncomfortable by that and like that's the point though like it is meant to make you feel uncomfortable like it it is meant to make you think like why do people rely so heavily on the West um, especially in the East like I think in, in, in a lot of Eastern countries like China there is a lot of reliance on on the global West and I just think that it's it's not as simple as being like well the white people are bad so like we shouldn't we shouldn't like accept anything that they do when in fact the fact of the matter is like it's so ingrained into society and like a lot of times the fact of the matter is is that like those countries are the countries that have money and like in this capitalistic world we live in a world where money talks and i just think that like i don't know i i know some people are uncomfortable by that but i i would just urge you to feel like Maybe it's supposed to make you feel uncomfortable. Maybe it's supposed to make you think about those real world co world connections. You think about places like Hong Kong, who have a very complicated relationship with imperialism and and with 
Western culture. And there is a sense of superiority in, a little bit in, um, in the way that people in Hong Kong... <laughs> If you're from Hong Kong, I'm sorry, but like this is this as as a, as a third party in Hong Kong who is a little more detached from the culture, there is a sense of superiority there when people feel like they can look down on mainland China. Um, they feel like they are less civilized quote-unquote um, and a lot of that comes from internalized white supremacy. And I'm not talking about like the Chinese government, right? Like, you have to understand, like, yes, the Chinese government is shit, but, like, regular old people in China are just people as well. When I used to go back to Hong Kong pretty regularly, like, the way I saw people treat um, mainland Chinese people was, like, really fucked up. Um, and again, fundamentally comes from the sense of, like, superiority, the sense that, like, they are more civilized in Hong Kong than in mainland China. It does kind of hint at a certain level of uh, romanticization of imperialism, of Western culture, um, that you do see. You do see in a lot of Chinese um, communities. I, I talk about this in um, my vlog where I read White Ivy as well. Ivy, this character who is um, a Chinese-American, she very much idolizes and, and romanticizes white culture and whiteness and, and privilege, and that is something that we see kind of like everywhere, unfortunately. And, um, and I think that it is something that is, is worth remembering when you're reading The Burning God, especially the ending of The Burning God, and why and why Rebecca Kwong, I think, decided to include that ending with the Hesperians and why it had to be that way. Because to not have it that way, to have the series be so realistic um, up until this point and to depict kind of the horrors of war and the horrors of, like, political alliances almost, for her to have that throughout the whole series and then to end without that ending, it would have completely made no sense at all. Um, and so I think for the, the only way for this to end was in that way. Um, and it, I think it also achieved her goal of kind of like highlighting the current state of affairs in terms of the relationship between countries in the East, Japan, Taiwan, China, um, Hong Kong, those countries and their relationship with the West. Um, I think it was really well done. I hope I semi made sense. Hopefully. I don't know. <laughs> Another thing that I've seen people be upset about the ending by is actually um, how Rin stops trusting Venka and Katai at the end and she ends up essentially she like kills Venka over it basically and how it's unfair and that Venka would never do that. First of all, I was sus of Venka the whole time. So like, I'm like, when that, when she said that, I was like, I fucking knew it. I fucking knew it. And then all of a sudden I was like, oh, okay, wait, never mind, never mind. I definitely understand criticisms of how like Venka, her character was completely underused. I think that's definitely, that was definitely like a really big missed opportunity. Um, but I think to say that like Rin was unfounded in her, her mistrust of these people, um, I don't think that's unfounded. Like, like she... <laughs> I think she had every right to be suspicious of her friends because again, Rin has no brain cells. She has no, she has no brain cells. Okay, um, but um, but yeah, I I, I did want to say that. Like, I do understand kind of the uh, criticisms in terms of Venka and how her character was uh, underused, mishandled, um, and how she had a lot more potential. And I totally agree with that. I do wish that we had time to kind of see her and Rin's relationship progress throughout the books. Um, but I wouldn't say it was like an absolutely necessary part of the book, you know? Another criticism I've seen, like again, this is the most chaotic book talk situation. Another criticism I've seen is Rin's parentage. It's hinted at in the books that um, Rin's dad is Jiang um, and her, his, her mother is, what's her name? Hanalai? Is that her name? Anyway, Rebecca kind of mentioned this in her live and she talked about how it's throughout this whole book, like it's, it's, it's meant to, it's, it's never meant to be, you know, Rin discovering who her parents are. Like that's never part of the story. Um, so that little tidbit at the end is just like, it's, it's just like more, she threw it in as more like an Easter egg to us rather than kind of like an actual plot point. Um, I can definitely see why people thought it was like open-ended or whatever. I personally like open endings, so I actually don't, I hate endings that tie everything up in a bow. So I 
again, I'm biased towards this kind of ending where everything is a little bit more open, a little bit more open to interpretation. That being said, I do think that in this case specifically, because it is so rooted in history, it's not actually as open-ended as it initially seems. If you look up in China what happened after the Civil War, and then you look up what happened in Taiwan after the Civil War, um, and after the Republic of China like fled to Taiwan and took over, Taiwan, you will kind of get a better sense of what is about to happen at the end um, after Nezha is like the last one standing. Um, a lot of people are pissed about that as well, that he's the last one standing. I actually think, I think it's a fitting ending. Um, you know, you all know I kind of love him. I love, he's my problematic fave. I just think he's such an interesting character. Um, and I think this is the perfect ending for him, considering that like, it's the whole like dying is easy, living is harder kind of thing. And like Rin and Katai got the most peaceful ending that they could have. And Nizha now has to live and deal with all the shit, despite having throughout the series been the one who can't handle shit. And now he has to handle shit. And I think that's really interesting. I think it's a very fitting ending for him. I think it's probably his worst case scenario. The fact that he has to live like this for the rest of his life. I think it sucks for him, but love to see Nizha getting what's coming to him essentially. And then the last kind of thing I, wa I did want to touch upon is colorism and how I've seen people say that it does it's not a book that um, dismantles colorism so that's disappointing. In these books Rebecca Kong has always tried to portray a very realistic light and that's why I loved it. Um, I think that if you were expecting it to have a more idealized ending. I think that, again, I think that would have been naive to think that that's what Miss Kwong was going to give us because <laughs> she has never given us a happy ending. I just don't think it was ever meant to be a book that dismantled colorism per se. Like it was, it's meant to highlight how fucked up things are and how fucked up things continue to be. Um, but it was never meant to be like Rin is a dark-skinned orphan girl so she can call, take over the world. Like I don't I don't think that was that was the point. Obviously I completely understand that like some people felt uncomfortable by like the portrayals of dark skinned characters in this book. Um, I personally think some of the criticisms were taken out of context. For example, a lot of people are like, oh but Alton is like one of the only dark skinned males and he's like villainized. I don't know if we read the same books but like Alton is not villainized in these books, okay? he is portrayed as nothing but a victim and a victim of his circumstances and the horrible things that he d does first of all the things he does is like nothing in comparison to like Nuja and even Kitai like if you think about it Kitai the way Kitai enables Rin is like so problematic <laughs> and anyway like that's that's another story for another time but like it's also very clear that from the second book onward after Alton dies that the Alton we see is not actually Alton it is Rin's kind of like the, a figment of Rin's imagination I think a lot of it is like Rin's projections of her self-hatred more than anything I just don't understand this idea that like Alton was villainized because I don't I never perceived Alton as a villain like if in all honesty if we're talking in the grand scheme of the Poppy War series Alton is like the least villainous of them all I just, so I just I just can't understand that line of thinking per se like I just feel like it's very taken out of context so yeah those are my kind of like spoilery thoughts about the endings and kind of like my thoughts about some of the criticisms I've seen floating around. At the end of the day, if you don't like the ending, that's your prerogative. Um, I will say just it's it's okay to be disappointed by the ending. I will say though that um, if you are disappointed by it because it didn't live up to what you expected in terms of like an epic fantasy ending, I would say maybe like consider why you had those expectations because I think a lot of times we as readers, especially as fantasy readers, like epic fantasy readers, we have been so used to up until this point reading a lot of white fantasies and those kind of like epic battle scenes, like the whole like Brandon Sanderson style of classic fantasy. I think we're really used to that and when a book doesn't give us that we end up being disappointed but at the at, fundamentally at the end of the day that expectation is rooted in a western style of storytelling in a genre that is traditionally not very diverse and I think it's important to acknowledge that even though we 
a book might not live up to our expectations, it's important to acknowledge whether or not our expectations were even something that the author was trying to do. R.F. Kuang has always depicted things in a very realistic light. She's always highlighted the realness, the brutality, um, the devastation of war. And like the reality is once a war is won, there's a lot of shit that happens politically. And like for me, the ending completely made sense. Like the trajectory of the Burning God completely made sense. We had like the epic battle scenes, but then we also just had the war ending. And then like Rin being like, what the fuck do I do now? Um, and her dealing with that. And I think that is so fitting for this series. Um, so I think to expect it to end in some sort of like an epic battle kind of situation was not not particularly realistic for this series uh per se that's kind of all i have to say those are kind of my my burning thoughts about <laughs> the burning god and the ending um i was gonna do like a full review but at the end of the day it's the third book in a series so like i didn't want to just make a review like full of spoilers so i did want to do this kind of like more informal book chat kind of situation hopefully Hopefully I haven't rambled too much and like made an ass of myself. And again, if you disagree with me, like feel free to comment down below. Let me know what your thoughts were um, and whether or not you also um, got these kind of like themes and messages out of the ending. Because at the end of the day, I feel like The Poppy War is not, is a, is, is a very theme driven series. Um, I think a lot, some books are like plot driven, character driven, whatever. But this series specifically is very, very theme driven. And I think that theme of like failed rebellion, um, of kind of the devastation of war, the brutal aftermath that, that regular people have to face based on the actions of their leaders, that theme and that theme and also like the overarching theme of imperialism, I think is so well done in this book. Um, and also, and highlighting that, that kind of weird relationship that a lot of countries who have been oppressed by people who have colonized them, how they maintain um, imperialistic um, relationships with them beyond their colonization. And I think that's a really important theme to discuss. Um, I think it's not one that is discussed very much in fiction, so I think that's really good. And I think fundamentally the series just brings two the West, so many bits of history that are so important. And again, these themes that we don't talk about as often as we should. That's all I have to say today. I definitely rambled. Hopefully I can edit this and like make it make some sort of sense. If I haven't, and you're still here after all my ramblings, thank you so much. Leave me a fire emoji um, if you made it to the end. And yeah, if you like this video, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up. And if you want to see more from me, I upload every Mondays and Fridays at 10 a.m. EST. Um, and you can hit the subscribe button and the bell thingy for notifications or whatever. Um, and yeah, that is it for today. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you guys next time.